Getting back to the Bolshevik Revolution, one of the ironies of it is that both Lenin and Trotsky were in exile, one in Germany, one in the United States. Tell us about how, who helped them get where they were going to make sure that revolution was pulled off. Well, let me summarize about four chapters into four minutes. Uh, Trotsky was in New York. Um, he had no income. I, I summed his income for the uh, year he was in New York. It was about $600. Yet he lived in an apartment. He had a chauffeured limousine. He had a refrigerator, which is very rare in those days. He left uh, New York and went to Canada on his way to the revolution. He had $10,000 in gold on him. He didn't earn more than $600 in New York. He was financed out of New York. There's no question about that. Um, the British took him off the ship in Halifax, uh, Canada. I got the Canadian archives. Uh, they knew who he was. They knew who Trotsky was. They knew he was going to start a revolution in Russia. Instructions from London came to put Trotsky back on the boat with his party and allow them to go forward. So there is no question that Woodrow Wilson, who issued the passport for Trotsky, and the New York financiers who financed Trotsky, and the British Foreign Office allowed Trotsky to perform his part in the revolution. Now over in Switzerland you get Lenin, who was in exile. He went through Germany in the famous sealed train by permission and by, with the encouragement of the German general staff. And yet Germany and Britain were supposed to be fighting each other. And you get them both moving these two key revolutionaries into place inside Russia. And then of course the rest is history. They created the revolution with no more than about 10,000 revolutionaries. They needed assistance from the West and they got assistance from Germany, from Britain and from the United States to continue and consolidate the revolution. Just tell us all over again why. Why? Just tell you won't it find again. this in the textbooks. Why is to bring about, I suspect, a plan to control world society in which you and I won't find the freedoms to believe and think and do as we believe. Did these uh, power brokers in actually envision at that time a one world government that would be socialist? Yes. The second statement I made was that they did not want the Soviet Union to develop into another free enterprise society and that this would offset, offset it. Aiding revolution would offset this event. That was made as a statement in 1919. You have various books, one by Gillette, the razor blade Gillette, uh, the, called The City, I think it was, which laid out this corporate socialism for the world to see as early as, what, 1905, 1910. So around the turn of the century, you begin to see actually written statements by these internationalist businessmen of the kind of socialist empire they wanted to bring about. It's there, but these books, of course, are not included in your courses in political science and history at the regular universities. Well, talk about the Red Cross mission. Red Cross mission to Russia, 19, uh, 1918. About 17, bankers, lawyers, businessmen. We well, yes, said a couple of do, doctors. A couple of there were two doctors, I think. Uh, there were two doctors. Uh, what was the mission? The mission was financed by William Boyce Thompson, the Chase Manhattan Bank Federal Reserve System. The Red Cross didn't want to send the mission. The Red Cross said we don't need a mission to Russia. They already had one in Romania, which was doing a good job. But William Boyce Thompson wanted this mission, and he put the money up. He financed it. And if you look, I, I printed a list of the people on the mission, and they were mostly bankers and lawyers, Wall Street lawyers, and people in and around the Wall Street establishment. The function or the purpose of this mission was to be in place to assist the Bolshevik Revolution. The Red Cross mission to Russia was a cover vehicle. It enabled these Wall Street elitists, these Wall Street manipulators to be there in place, and then I traced the cable one million dollars from the Morgan Company in New York to Petrograd. I forget to which bank, but it came from William Boyce Thompson, and which financed the revolution. And then they put pressure back in the State Department in Washington to actually send arms to the revolution, which went forward in 1918. And then I found in the State Department files, files an extraordinary telegram in which Trotsky appealed to the State Department to send American army instructors to train the new Soviet army. And I think I reprinted that in uh, one of my earlier books. So 
briefly the Red Cross mission was a cover vehicle to enable Wall Street to be there in place to guide and manipulate the ongoing Bolshevik revolution. And what was the response of the State Department? Oh yes, they were quite willing to send U.S. arm instructors. Do you know how to I don't know if they went forward. I know the arms, I know the rifles went forward. I didn't trace the, the response to the telegram except it was approved within the State Department. And I reprinted the telegram. I never did find a response. That's probably taken out the files. Do you know the figure to which uh, Wall Street supported the Bolsheviks? Well, it was $1 million. Just the William Boyce Thompson figure? Uh, that figure. But then you've got the other assistants. For example, the whole Siberian episode. See, in 1918, the Bolsheviks really only controlled Moscow and what was then Petrograd, which is now Leningrad. They could not have beaten off uh, the White Russians, um, the, uh, the Czechs, who were in Russia at that time, uh, the Japanese, who were anti-Bolshevik. They could not have beaten it off without assistance from the United States and from Britain. And the Siberian Railroad is critical because if you look at that map of Russia, you know, Moscow is, and uh, Leningrad are stuck at the left end, and you've got the vast expanse of Russia, which, and the, the backbone is the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Now, the history books will tell you that American troops went in, they occupied the Trans-Siberian Railroad in order to prevent the Japanese from coming in. Well, this is absolute nonsense. Uh, I've never written the book. I hope to get around to it one day. I've got two big boxes of files on this. The purpose of the American army in Siberia was to hold the Trans-Siberian Railroad until the Bolsheviks were strong enough to take it over. And they, they did that very effectively. They held off the Japanese. They held them back near Manchuria. They evacuated the Czechs out along the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The French and the British gave up because they said the Americans are helping the Bolsheviks. They evacuated. And in one of these books, I reprinted a little clipping from the New York Times of, I think, 1919. Finally, the Bolsheviks got to Vladivostok right at the, uh, the far end of Siberia, near Japan, in which the local commissar addressed the American army and thanked them for aiding the revolution. And that was in the New York Times, and I reprinted, reprinted it. Now, this is totally contrary to everything you find in the textbooks. The textbooks say we went into Siberia um, to at least be neutral, and uh, I suppose most people would assume we went in to stop the Bolsheviks. We didn't. We went in to help the Bolsheviks. There's no question about that. There's no question that they could not have consolidated their revolution without the capitalists. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They had too many enemies. Not only, not only outside enemies, uh, the white Russians, they, they, uh, the Ukrainians themselves were not particularly happy. And all, the, all the ethnic groups in Russia were not particularly happy with the Bolsheviks. They could not have won without Western assistance. There is no question about that. Then they were starving. The, the factory, they couldn't operate the factories because the Bolsheviks shot all the managers and the technicians. Either that or they left Russia. The factories were closed down. The Russia was starving. By 1922, Lenin himself said the end has come. They had no food. They had these, uh, these uh, closed down plants. The plants were not destroyed in the revolution. That's what the textbooks will tell you, including Kennan, the State Department expert. He says the, the plants, were, the Russian factories were destroyed in the revolution. They were not destroyed. Why? Because I've seen the photographs after the revolution and the right in the Hoover Institution Tower. There are these massive boxes of photographs of Russian industry after the revolution. It, they, they could not operate the plants. So what do we do with Avril Harriman and uh, the Nash Chase Bank and National Bank and our old friends on Wall Street? They go in there. And of course the Hoover mission to feed Russia. We go in there and we have these 250, 300 concessions in which American companies went into Russia and they started up the idle plants. Harriman, Avil Harriman took the manganese concessions, Armand Hammer, Occidental Petroleum, took the pencil factories and the asbestos plants. And all these top capitalists went in and they got Russia going on behalf of the Bolsheviks because the Bolsheviks either shot or kicked out all the people who could run, all the Russians who could run the plants. Another point, that Tsarist industry was at a very high level. 
Your textbooks would tell you that Tsarist industry was backward. It wasn't until the Soviets came along that it began to make progress. This is absolute nonsense. The Soviets, uh, the Russians in 1913 had two indigenous Russian vehicles, Russian automobiles. There has never been an indigenous Soviet automobile. They've all come from the West. The Tsarist Russians produced an airplane in 1916 with a wingspan longer than the um, 747. This is not known today. It's just wiped out history. Uh, technologically, the Tsarist Russians were at least on a par with the rest of the world. They only began to decline when the Soviets took over. And then you've got the long history from that point onwards. Uh, we got the first five-year plan, 1929-1933. I look at the first five-year plan, I look at every plant that was built in Russia at that time. Every single plant was built by a Western company. Not one single plant was built by the Soviets. You name any plant, if there are any Russians here from way back, you name any plant in the first five-year plan, and you know as well as I do who built it. It wasn't the Soviets, it was a Western company. And you run down the list, uh, Caterpillar tractor. There are more Caterpillar tractors in the Soviet Union than are outside the Soviet Union. <laughs> Ford, Ford Model A, that, well, Ford built the, the Gorky plant. That, and as soon as the Ford engineers left, they started to turn out military vehicles. Uh, you name it, in the first five-year plan, every single plant was built basically by American companies, but a lot of British, uh, French, and um, uh, German, and Japanese were in there too. Then the second five-year plan in the 1930s was a duplicate. They tried to copy the first five-year plan with their own resources. They fell flat on their faces, and they had to come back to the Western companies to, to, for assistance to duplicate the plants put in the first five-year plan. And for example, I was in Douglas Aircraft Company. They let me into their files, and it was amazing. The detailed assistance given by Douglas Aircraft, they bought one DC-3, and then they bought a DC-3 in sub-assembly and uh, all kinds of duplicate spare parts to get the thing going. And then we've got that story, I don't know how much detail you want, which continues right up to today, July 1, 1987. And you mentioned, I think, this morning, the Toshiba and the, Norwe the Toshiba Japanese plant and the uh, Norwegian company, a government-owned plant, which provided the milling machines, which enabled now the uh, Soviet submarines to be ten times quieter than they were before, and that's going to cost us four billion dollars so that we can offset what we have given them. And this stupidity has continued for, well, stupidity in my sense. From the viewpoint of a Wall Street capitalist, I guess it's smart business. Uh, this has continued for uh, 60 years. And this supposedly by our allies, but this is not the people of Japan and no. Norway. No. This is again the internationalists. It's the internationalists. Toshiba represented on the Trilateral Commission, founded by David Rockefeller in 1973. It's your top corporate, corporate elitists, your top corporate uh, establishment attorneys, the top politicians. Uh, Senator Mansfield uh, once said, you, unless you, you don't get along unless you go along.